My name is Natalie Gruber, and I am currently a doctoral candidate at ASU in the Teachers College in the Educational Leadership and Innovation Program. I am a licensed clinical social worker, and I have certificates in art therapy and mindfulness facilitation. And I am involved in research, teaching, scholarship, and program development in the areas of mindfulness, mental health, and education to promote systems of care that support students and families. Mindfulness is a word that people are hearing a lot nowadays. Mindfulness essentially is placing your attention on the present moment and being interested in what your experience is. So having the intention to pay attention in a way that is open and curious about your own direct experience. So there are multiple ways that we can pay attention. A really common way to pay attention using mindfulness is to learn to focus your attention on the sensations of your breathing. You could also pay attention to your body sensations, thoughts, emotions, really anything that is happening for you right now in your direct experience and being really open to what you find there. So not necessarily pushing away or pretending you're having a different experience, just being really open and honest with yourself about what it is you're experiencing now. And this might sound really simple, and really, in a way, it is. It's also kind of complex. When you first start practicing, you realize that your mind typically is wandering off in various directions, either into the future or backwards into the past. And so this is really a skill and a practice that we, anyone can cultivate and anyone can benefit from, but it is something we need to practice and learn how to do. And the reason mindfulness is so important is because it actually, as we practice, we are altering the structures and functions of our brains and we are building towards more self-regulation and in our harmony, we're supporting our physical health, our mental health, and our relational health too. Meditation is one form of practicing mindfulness, of placing your attention on the present moment with this attitude of openness and curiosity. So mindfulness, you can almost think of it as sports. There are all different variations and ways that you can practice mindfulness. And that could include seated meditation, closing your eyes, focusing on your breathing. It could include walking meditation, paying attention to body sensations, or even what's happening in your environment as you're walking around campus, for example. But you could also bring your mindful awareness and energy to your eating, to conversations, to listening to other people. So typically there are two different categories of mindfulness practice, and that would be formal practice, where eyes are closed and we're paying attention to maybe our breathing or our body sensations. And then there's also informal practice, and that would include paying attention to your direct experience when you're walking or eating or even having a conversation with someone. So those are just a few examples. And there are multiple applications. We tend to think about education as being this really passive process where we are absorbing our learning and maybe even regurgitating it back onto standardized tests or something like that. But really, and I bring a totally different perspective to education as a mental health professional with background in mindfulness and art therapy. I'm a big believer in holistic education, which is a curriculum that was proposed by a scholar named John Miller. And what he essentially is a proponent of is that even in K through 12 education, we need to bring in a systems perspective. And that systems application to education could include the child as a system. So our educational system itself thinks about education in a very linear way. It's as though we're just educating a child's brain. But there's so much more to education and 
to us as humans than our brains, right? So holistic education thinks about bringing in not just your brain, but your body movement. That could include yoga to release tension and stress during the day. It could include your inner life. So really integrating your learning. It could also include understanding connections between different subject matters. It includes community, recognizing our connections to others. And that could be in the classroom or the school environment, the greater community. It could also include really the world, thinking about how certain issues affect us as people and the planet too. So global warming would be a, a great example of that. It affects us all in different ways. And so with an understanding of how our nervous systems work, I think it's important to say here that when we're feeling regulated, when we're feeling calm, and we have a sense of inner well-being, mindfulness does an excellent job of supporting our nervous systems and helping us feel this way. We are so much more available to form connections with other people, to learn, and to also be in a state of play and creativity. And I think that we typically associate learning with maybe being this, maybe not necessarily painful process, but it's a process that's sort of done to us. And I believe that learning can happen when our social engagement systems within our nervous systems are activated. We're feeling a sense of stability and well-being. And then we are much more likely to be willing to take on new tasks, try on new things, form new connections with different people. And so learning actually doesn't have to be this really passive experience. It can be much more active and it can include more parts of ourselves. And we can perhaps even learn better when we're feeling this sense of well-being and we're able to take creative risks and have fun along the way. Because if education, whether it's K through 12 or college, isn't the time to do that, to take creative risks and to have fun and absorb our learning and build connections with others, which sets us up for the rest of our lives, when is the time for that? I am extremely passionate about teaching parents how to meditate, mindfulness. I came to mindfulness actually motivated to learn. My twin boys were two years old at the time. And I realized that there was very often no time to take a break. I was sleep deprived and I needed a practice or something that I could do in the moment to settle myself and calm my nervous system. Because I knew that when I was more calm, my children were more, more calm too. And if you turn to the research at what children's emotion regulation, how children's emotion regulation develops, it is within the context of the parent-child relationship and parent-child interactions. Specifically, communication is really key to this. And parents who are feeling more regulated and calm internally have a much easier time communicating calmly and clearly and really effectively with their children. So my dissertation research looks at what effect teaching parents mindfulness has on parents' emotion regulation, children's emotion regulation, and the parent-child relationship. And I have some very exciting and robust findings that demonstrate that teaching parents just how to bring mindfulness into their daily lives, not necessarily into parenting, they will practice it. You teach them to practice, they will practice, and they will learn practices that I have taught them, such as stop or rain, that they can use in the moment with their children to, to center themselves first, or to just use in everyday life. So what happens actually is as parents learn how to practice mindfulness, their emotion regulation improves. So this happens in the class as we're practicing together. 
And then they take practices that I've taught them out into their daily lives and they use them over and over and over again to regulate themselves when difficulty inevitably arises in life. This has an extraordinary effect on children. What I have seen through my own research is that once parents feel more regulated internally, they also become a lot more aware of themselves, what's going on within them internally. They become more aware of the fact that they are connected to other people and that those connections actually really matter. They also become more aware of what might be going on inside of other people. So a really influential teacher in the field of mental health who is on my dissertation committee, his name is Dr. Dan Siegel, has had a huge influence on my thinking about mindfulness. And he has a term called mindsight. And mindsight essentially means that we have an awareness of what's going on inside of ourselves. We understand why we're feeling, how we're feeling. And we also have an awareness of other people and have a basic understanding of where they might be coming from and what they might be thinking. So this skill is essential in parenting because one of the major jobs of a parent is to really have a good sense of attunement to what a child is feeling and then be able to meet attunement, whatever the child's needs are in the present moment, with a response. And children's nervous systems are just developing. And so what parents can do is they help, a, a huge role that parents play is helping children learn to emotionally regulate themselves. So as parents strengthen this ability to know what's going on within themselves and within their child, it turns out they actually respond naturally in ways that help support children's emotion regulation. And one of the exciting findings from my study is actually that discipline is the thing that really changes when parents learn to practice mindfulness. They get better at it. And when I say discipline, I don't mean punishment. I mean teaching children about their behavior. And this is a skill that all parents have. All parents probably feel at some point that they need help with strengthening and getting more effective at. And so what the parents in my study did just naturally, I didn't teach them anything about discipline, is they learned how to self-regulate. They would take a pause when their child engaged in a behavior that wasn't appropriate for whatever reason. They would set the limit right away with the child and let them know that this behavior was not okay. Then they would take a moment to settle themselves, encourage the child to self-reflect. And if the parent themselves had made an error in the interaction with the child, the parent would apologize and take responsibility as a way of modeling self-reflection, also promoting trust and security within the relationship. And they would encourage the child to do the same. And so the child was essentially learning to build their mindset, their own awareness of what was going on within themselves. Why did they behave the way that they did? And then from a calm, connected state between parent and child, parents were actually able to better teach their children about their behavior. And what was really exciting is that I saw evidence of this in my research, as children were essentially able to internalize their learning about their behavior, and they were able to carry it forward. So there was a great little example that came up in one of my interviews, my research interviews. And the example was that a, a kindergartner who spilled water, this is something he had done before, and would typically, before the parent learned to practice mindfulness, he would spill the water and he would actually hide it. And the parent told me that she would, before practicing mindfulness, she would probably yell at her son if he spilled the water. But instead, the way that she was responding to him repeatedly in a calm, regulated manner and teaching him about his behavior led him to recently spill some water announced to his parents, I spilled some water. Then what did he do? He went and got a towel, he cleaned it up, and then he said, I'm sorry, I love you. 
So the child felt safe enough to announce their mistake. They knew what to do to correct the issue, just wipe up the water. And they felt comfortable enough sharing this with their parent and also very connected as evidenced by the I love you. So feeling comfortable and uh, as though it's okay to make mistakes. And so both parent and child were very well regulated within this situation. So this is a great little example of what can happen when parents learn to practice mindfulness. They strengthen their regulation from the inside out. It happens internally first, and then it happens in connection with their children. And then their children really absorb this. And they receive the benefits of a totally different style of parenting and communication and discipline, which becomes opportunities for learning. So it turns out that parents learning to practice mindfulness impacts parents, it impacts the parent-child dynamic, and it impacts children. But it also impacts, amazingly, it has the ability to impact, I should say, three generations. So the parents in my dissertation research learned to practice mindfulness themselves and then they would come back each week and they would tell me stories about how because they were benefiting so much from mindfulness practices, they were actually sharing their practices with maybe their siblings, so members of their same generation or maybe a brother-in-law or a sister-in-law. And then they were talking about how they were sharing mindfulness with their parents. So now we're talking about the generation ahead. And for participants in my study, the children actually at this school were also practicing mindfulness. But what happened when parents learned to practice mindfulness is that they had this newfound understanding of what their children meant when their children would say things to them like, you need a mindful moment. And so parent and child for the first time would be practicing mindfulness together to co-regulate. And so we're talking about teaching one parent how to practice mindfulness and the ripple effects trickling out into same generation, future generation, and the upcoming generation. So that's really exciting. And because families tend to be highly influenced by just one member of the family changing, this is actually called family systems theory, teaching one person to practice mindfulness and bring more awareness into themselves, more regulation into themselves, a different style of communication, a different style of disciplining, actually has the ability to impact dynamics of an entire family system. So what's really exciting about my research is it really de clearly demonstrates teaching one person to practice mindfulness can have a whole series of ripple effects. I'm essentially, in my dissertation, making the argument that more research needs to be done comparing the outcomes of mindfulness practice with psychotherapy. There have been multiple studies that have looked at medication versus mindfulness. There was a very uh, scientifically sound study that just came out in the Journal of American Medicine that looked at the impact of mindfulness versus anti-anxiety medication and found that mindfulness was just as effective as anti-anxiety medication in the treatment of anxiety. But there aren't very many studies that look at the difference between outcomes between psychotherapy and mindfulness. And I would like to make the argument that more research needs to be done in this area because oftentimes what people are coming to psychotherapy for includes issues connected with emotion regulation. Maybe they have an issue with anger or an issue with anxiety and it's impacting them personally and in relationships. And what we know with mindfulness is that we are strengthening our ability to regulate ourselves from the inside out, and that this tends to have a really positive influence on our interactions with others in relationships. I'm not necessarily making the argument, though, either that mindfulness and psychotherapy are the same thing. I think it's really useful for 
uh, people to have an outlet, to have a therapist to talk to if they need to, to process things, and to have another person to bear witness to their experience and help them to process it and have that experience become a little bit more integrated within them and not be potentially causing them a lot of discomfort or some form of emotional disturbance. So I think that there are definitely parallels to mindfulness versus psychotherapy. And I would like to also say that connected to my dissertation research, what I have found is that the role of the mindfulness teacher is very similar to the role of the therapist. So if the mindfulness teacher shows up to the class and demonstrates a sense of unconditional positive regard for their students and really models self-reflection and humility, they're really encouraging their students to do the same thing and to develop those capacities. And I will also say that practicing mindfulness in a group has extraordinary potential because what starts happening is as the teacher models self-reflection and discussion about how mindfulness maybe helped them in a moment of difficulty, what starts to happen is people start reflecting, but they also start sharing. And when people start hearing of each other's self-problems, as one of my participants in my research talked about, it becomes a little bit more normalized that we all suffer in some way and experience difficulties, and we all need skills and tools to meet those challenges. And when we hear that others are dealing with maybe a different version of something very similar to what we're experiencing, it gives us more strength and resiliency. It helps us feel more connected, and like our problems aren't so special or different from others, that we're actually really connected to each other, and we all suffer, and we all have that in common. And so having that awareness is really um, healing, I would say, in itself, and it's very empowering. And so therapy and meditation aren't necessarily the same thing, but oftentimes we do see very similar outcomes. I have received a $10,000 grant from Columbia University, from their teacher's college, from the Spirituality Mind Body Institute. And this is an innovating forward seed grant. And the idea behind these grants were try out something in higher education, an idea you always wanted to try that could support student well-being on college campuses and their spiritual development. And when I say spiritual development, what I mean is, at least through the lens of my own program, this awareness that you are not just you. You belong to something greater than yourself, meaning the world around you. We all belong to a social fabric of life. We all belong to an ecological fabric of life as well, right? We depend on the earth for our health and our food and sustenance. And so my program, the idea that I always wanted to try, is a drop-in mindfulness program for ASU students to build their stress reduction skills through learning to practice mindfulness in various aspects of their daily life, including walking, eating, sitting, talking, listening to other people, and to also promote opportunities for social connection. So we know that on college campuses today that the need for counseling far outweighs availability to provide those counseling services and that most people who need college who need counseling on a college campus will never receive it. There are many barriers to accessing counseling. There are stigmas associated with admitting that maybe you need some counseling and some help. And so mindfulness, what I love about mindfulness, is we are learning to self-regulate, having an opportunity to practice together in a group. That's what my program is about. So come in, students feel better when they leave because we've all practiced and learned together. And then they have something that they can take out of the classroom with them into their daily lives. 
And I am very intentional about both teaching mindfulness practices that are in connection with other people. So those are called relational mindfulness practices. And I learned these practices at UCLA in their Mindful Awareness Research Center where I did my teacher training as a mindfulness instructor. And they have all of these really fun and creative ways of practicing mindfulness together in relationship or just interaction with other people. And they have developed these practices with college students who they found sometimes would catch on to what mindfulness is faster if they practiced it in the presence of another person. And so we do these relational mindfulness practices, but we also have time to just get to know each other, have conversation, people ask me questions, we have discussions about things that are on people's minds. And we also knew this semester, because of the grant, we're also gonna be having dinner together. I'm able to provide food. So this is a really meant to be fun, engaging, learn something, reflect on yourself, but also connect with other people. So I've had people who have come to my sessions who have said things like, this is so much fun, or I'm brand new to campus, and actually this is the first time I've connected with anyone. And not only that, but I feel like people are more open as a result of practicing mindfulness and maybe feeling a little more relaxed to really connect with each other on a different level in more of a genuine, very connected way. And so my program is about learning, it's about connection, it's about fun, it's about reducing stress, and I'm really excited about the opportunity to offer it here at ASU. So this program is being offered, as I said, through an Innovating Forward Seed Grant from the Teachers College at Columbia University. And it is designed to be a program where the funding is used for one year. So my hope is that a program just like the one I've created using this model would be sustained in some way at ASU because the program is really about learning and practicing mindfulness together. And it's also really about building and forming connection and community. And so really my overall goal for this program is to develop a secular, this is non-religious, uh, oriented mindfulness practice community at ASU that anyone who is part of the ASU community can engage in and feel like they can show up as they are and form some new connections or build on uh, existing connections and feel as though they belong and that they are supported and engaged and mindfulness practices can really assist with all of that. There are multiple ways that teachers can incorporate mindfulness into curriculum at all age levels. Part of my work with Dr. Dana Henriksen in the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College here at ASU has been looking at evaluating the impact of district-wide mindfulness teaching within the Bolt School District, which is a Title I school district right here in Phoenix, Arizona. And we had been brought on board about three years ago uh, to be researchers evaluating the impact of district-wide mindfulness teaching. And it all began with the pilot school, Crockett Elementary, where they've been practicing mindfulness for about six years, and they had such tremendous success that the whole school district was motivated to take on district-wide mindfulness training. And through my research with Dr. Henriksen on mindfulness in schools there, what we've seen is many, many, many creative adaptations of mindfulness woven into regular classroom uh, routines and rituals such as um, even school-wide on the morning announcements every morning there's a mindfulness practice or teachers can get as creative as they want to I've seen teachers incorporate mindfulness into art activities or other areas of uh, classroom routine and development and I've also seen that within this school district they actually have a hand signal 
uh, where students can basically communicate their needs. So there are different hand signals for even needing to use the bathroom or leave the classroom. But there's also a hand signal for needing to take a mindful moment. And students can at any time during the school day hand signal to an adult that they need to take a mindful moment. And essentially what that means is the student can take some conscious, purposeful breaths just to calm their nervous systems, stop whatever it is they're doing, and just regulate themselves using their breathing. One of the amazing things that I witnessed firsthand is not only can students take a mindful moment for themselves, but they can also suggest that the entire class take a mindful moment together. And when I saw this happen, I thought it was really exciting because it was almost like witnessing collective emotion regulation brought on by a student suggesting it to a teacher. So the student raised their hand asking for that mindful moment and the teacher said to the student, sensing what was going on in the classroom, they were a little bit dysregulated, is this for yourself or for the whole class? And the student said, this is for the class. And the teacher said, you're right, we need to take a mindful moment. So everybody just took a moment to reconnect with themselves and settle themselves down. And then they were able to return to what was actually a very technical and challenging lesson on science. So mindfulness can be practiced on the spot, taking a mindful moment, or it can be practiced as part of regular routines, such as the morning announcements. So as a person with mental health training, as a therapist and art therapist, that was where my training was at the point in time when I applied for the EDD program. I was actually a stay-at-home mom at the time, and I was witnessing everything that the students were sort of dealing with that had nothing to do with education but was impacting their education a lot, namely mental health. I started really thinking about how education could become so much more innovative to include across the board practices to support student mental health woven into the educational experience and just even maybe more available on campuses through perhaps other offerings besides just counseling. And so I started thinking about how can systems sort of change to support student well-being. And when we moved here to Arizona, um, we were living in Cincinnati just before this, my husband happened to hear from a colleague that he was finishing his EDD in the MLFTC Leadership and Innovation Program. And he was talking about how he was measuring his work and creating innovations within education. And I thought, hmm, that sounds actually kind of right up my alley. I've, I had been thinking about how education could support student mental health more and really feeling ready to do something new. I felt as though the mental health crisis that we've been experiencing way exceeds what counselors, social workers, therapists, psychologists can do one-on-one -on -one in, you know, behind closed doors in a therapy office. I think that we need a much more proactive across the board approach to supporting children's mental health from the beginning, the whole range of K through 12, even up into higher education. And I think that these programs could be positive, skills-based, they can be fun, they can be self-exploratory, they can encourage connection and a sense of belonging. So there's all of these different ways that we can promote student mental health in education. And I have to also say that I had a lot of research experience and thought that I would pursue a PhD at some point in my career before I applied for the EDD program. But what really drew me into this program in particular is action research. So the idea that we are actually applying our knowledge and expertise, that we are having the skills and tools to measure how effective our work is and reflect on it and tie it into research and best practice to continue to innovate forward 
and the fact that there was a systems-oriented way of thinking and organizational change. These are all essentials to practically reforming education. And I'm really excited to be part of innovating forward in education. MLFTC has truly transformed me, I would say, as a professional and as a person. So getting back to the idea that connections in education are so important, I was connected very early on in my program here with Dr. Dana Henriksen. And she has been the most exquisite, fabulous mentor. She has opened so many doors for me and really believed in all of my skills, talents, and abilities and my knowledge base. And she has had so much respect for my knowledge base in the fields of art therapy, mindfulness, and mental health. And she and I have published 10 articles or so and counting. And she's brought me on board for so many exciting projects and really her mentorship and all of the opportunities she has brought have, to me has really developed me in a way beyond sort of what I didn't think was possible. I can't believe in just three years, everything that I've been able to do and all the doors that have opened for me. And a lot of that has to do with Dana's open-mindedness her willingness to support and promote me through these um, experiences, and also Dr. Punya Mishra's mindset of being so open-minded and creative and innovative, and all the ways that Dr. Mishra has brought me on board with his work too. And so being feeling like I belong and that my areas of interest and expertise and knowledge really matter, and are really valued in education and giving me so many opportunities to try on new ideas has led to incredibly expansive growth for me and so many wonderful opportunities. And I'm so grateful and I feel that I have really learned how to be a professional researcher and how to be a scholar and a teacher and a thought leader. So I've really developed uh, the structure of our program, led us to use technology in different ways. So whether that was recording a podcast for a class or recording ourselves talking about issues, these skills are so essential to becoming a thought leader in the field and being able to disseminate our scholarly work and knowledge. And there's a great emphasis on that in this program. So I'm applying this already as I'm using my Innovating Forward Seed Grant funds to offer my program, uh, which actually, which is called Mind Heart Mindfulness. And essentially, Mind Heart Mindfulness is an innovation in education. And I'm using everything that I've learned here at MLFTC to do that. So I created a program that was designed to support student mental health and address social isolation as an underlying factor connected to mental health, as well as stress. So the intervention then is this program that I've developed to teach mindfulness build and support social connections among students on campus and create a community. And then I have the skills to take a look at how is this going to, to really sort of gauge and measure my work and constantly be adapting it. And I've been doing that all along and also understanding the greater context in which this intervention is taking place within the organizational system of ASU. So that's just an example of creating an innovation in, in education. And I would say too that this emphasis on technology, I will be this semester, this is sort of brand new, I will be recording, re-recording mindfulness teachings that I share with the group so that people can go back and they can practice these meditation practices again and again, as many times as they want to on their own so they can really bring it into their daily lives. And with the students who are helping me on the program, 
they are also going to be recording two-minute videos to summarize what we learned and what we did so that people can really get a sense and flavor for the program and maybe feel incentivized that they want to join as well, or at least have an awareness of what's going on within our program. And so we'll be building this catalog of resources that people can have access to that will live on beyond when the seed grant funding ends. And so this is another application of understanding technology and use of technology for teaching, learning, and disseminating scholarship in action and thought leadership within the field. Mm -hmm.